Okay, today we're going to continue in chapter one, and we're going to get more into the advantages and disadvantages and the different types of diesel engines that are out there. And this slide right here kind of shows you what precipitated the changes in diesels. And so we're going to get into this a lot more when we get into the exhaust system. But you can see this is the EPA system, and I don't really know why they put these bin numbers on there. I don't know this. The important thing here is you can see the volume. This is noxious oxide, which in diesels, the two things that we're trying to regulate are no no nitrous oxide and particulate. That's the black soot that's coming out. So these are the two things that we're trying to regulate in a diesel engine. And those two items have to come down. And so this column here is particulate metal and down here is nitrous oxide. And you can see clear up there in 2007 is when it began the process. So you started it in 2007 by 2010, you needed to be there. And so they had a system, we have particulate matter has to be here and then it dropped down to here and then it's come down and we're already down in here. So in 2016, we went from this much matter down to this much matter. So, and we have another tier five coming up in the next, I guess, in the about five years or something like that. So in the near future, there's another tier coming that we gotta hit and it's a different regulation. So we're not done. They're still regulating, they're still changing, they're still clamping down. So the amount of soot, the amount of visible smoke is virtually gone. All modern diesels have virtually no smoke. So it has to be removed. And there's a time frame. You only have so many seconds of smoke before it has to be clean. Now, and older vehicles that, you know, that do not do they, are they not necessarily exempt, but I know that sometimes they exempt those. Sometimes. Older vehicles at a certain year are exempt by the federal government, but what happens is certain, certain states, certain counties can change the regulation and they can make a regulation and say that all vehicles within their county has to meet this emission standards. And so most of them are saying you have to meet this standard. Or you can't. So like you have government puts out a bid to build a building. And there are some counties that have a certain amount, 50%, 90% of the vehicles on site have to have tier four emission standards. Uh, some of them it's 100% have to meet tier four standards. Yes, I know that I saw, <clears throat> probably a few months ago, I saw, I saw diagram or whatever but in certain parts in California the bigger engines they don't allow the older trucks in those areas because of the so California is usually the leader in that if you go to Seattle King County you cannot drive a semi into King County that does not have tier 4 emissions and so if like my brothers have a semi, they can't drive and deliver their product. They could drive to the edge of King County and they would have to hire somebody else to haul the product into wherever they go. And so that's here in the state of Washington. It's not obviously here, but King County, Seattle area. So it depends on where you are. So some places to be on site, you have to meet it. Some places it's county-wide, some places it could be statewide. In California, it's district or county uh, ordinances, not statewide. And some of them you have to go back. If you want an old machine, you have to retrofit the old machine. Sometimes and most of the time it's easier to buy a new machine rather than to try to retrofit the old machines, but there's a whole bunch of retrofit kits that do that. So I know with all the emissions, Obviously, black smoke, it's compressed air. It has less emissions than gas. It has a different kind of emission than gas. It's a different kind of emission. The different emissions. And so the two emissions in diesel that we're regulating is nitrous oxide and particulate. <clears throat> particulate is unburned fuel that's going out because we're overfueling, fueling at the wrong time, wrong quality fuel, cold engine. I mean, there's a lot of things that lead to particulate matter. Nitrous oxide 
comes when we have too high of cylinder temperature. So that's why we do gas recirculation, is they bring those gases back in, they're trying to cool the simple cylinder temperature off, they're trying to slow the burn down a little bit, because the higher the cylinder temperature, the more nitrous oxide is developed. And we're gonna get into these in a different chapter, I think it's the next chapter. But those are the two that we're trying to regulate in a diesel engine is nitrous oxide and particulate matter. So they're different. Gasoline engines, we have carbon dioxide, monoxide, which is a, a big problem. And they have some other issues that we're trying to deal with. So in diesels, different, we're trying to do these two. So that's all we're trying to deal with. So in a gas engine, we're igniting that mixture with a spark plug. We have two problems, detonation and pre-ignition. If you have detonation or pre-ignition in a, in a car, you can blow a hole in your piston, you can blow the rings off, you can blow the head gaskets. There's a lot of damage that can take place because we don't have any air fuel mixture in there. Pre-ignition and detonation don't really come into play with a diesel engine. So we're using heater compression and we're putting the fuel in and starting the burn with that. So we don't see that issue. <clears throat> So we're going to skip this one and go here, compression ratios. So in a diesel engine, we have compression ratios that are usually somewhere in this area. So 10.1 would be really low compression ratio for a diesel engine, usually somewhere in the 12, 12 to 16, 12 to 18. This range here is indirect or direct injection, I mean, so lower compression, direct injection. When we get up into indirect direct injection, those are 16 up to here. And you can see how the curve drops off dramatically. Yes, you can go higher than that, but the starting system, the starter has to be so large to be able to crank it up against that compression. The flywheel has to be so big. The seriousness of the thickness of the, the connecting rod and the piston and all the components have to be so robust it's just not worth it. The extra weight defeats the purpose. And you gotta remember it takes time for fuel to burn. And so if you compress this giant volume down into the size of a pea and when a pea doubles in size it's now the size of a marble and you double that again and now I'm at a golf ball and I double again and I'm now at a baseball and I double again and so by the time that flame starts to, to grow if I started the size of a pea the piston is going to be at the bottom of the stroke before it gets up to be a baseball and then and the cavity's gone so when you get up past this 23 to 1 then the time it takes for that flame to grow it just doesn't work. <clears throat> so you just don't see it. It's just not cost effective and it just drops off very quickly. So the only thing that ran that high was indirect injection. And what we are learning, we're going to be learning throughout this book is in the, I'm going to say old days, and when I say old days, it's not very long ago, it'd be like six years ago. Old days, high speed compact diesels used indirect injection to get that speed. To get high speeds and all that, we went to indirect injection with a lot of the small compact diesels that we deal with. Most of what we deal with in this industry are indirect injection. With the tier four emissions that we just looked at, the only way to achieve tier four emissions is to go to a common rail diesel fuel system, jack the pressure up, and go to direct injection. So virtually all diesels are direct injection today. That's a quick change from just a couple of years ago. And so you have two facets, two technologies. We've got the mechanical, so when I say old, it's mechanical up to 2010, 2012. That's the whole days in this particular subject. In those days, we had mechanical drive, mechanical injection systems, and we had a huge amount of indirect injection. And then when tier four, man, uh, tier four standards started to play, there was a quick change. 
and we went to electronic fuel injection. So now the injectors are all electronic and we're injecting it, we're con computer controlling it. We go to super high, te uh, high pressure and we're monitoring, we put exhaust filters and all the other stuff that we got put on there. So the, the engines are twice as complicated, three times as complicated as they were before. So major change in there. And that's kind of the device. So this is indirect and this is your, this is direct and this is indirect. So, so we don't even see it up there anymore. <clears throat> so compression pressures, higher compression ratio provides greater expansion. So when you went to indirect, you had greater expansion, you had more, so you compress this object up and we had more distance to push that piston down. So that's kind of the thought process that they had with these high compression ratios. But at the same time, when I try to compress and I'm trying to take that little teeny cavity and I'm trying to expand it, you, you lose the amount of time to get it to work. So there's advantages and disadvantages there. So greater expansion ratio produces more power with less fuel better fuel mixing, so when you compress it down into a smaller area, you're cramming those molecules together, just like the more you push on your hands when you rub them, the more heat you're gonna create, the more turbulence, the more it mixes, when you slam those molecules together, it's gonna break it apart. And with it breaking apart smaller and smaller, it should burn more efficient. We have an excess amount of air, the more we can break that fuel into smaller particles, the better. So why can we reduce the compression ratio with the new modern system versus trying to go with a higher compression ratio in the old system? What's the major thing that accomplishes this particular piece with a lower compression ratio? The newer technology of the injectors and higher injector pressures. So by going to common rail system and super high pressure. So we're gonna go from 24, 2500 PSI and in indirect injection, PSI pressure, or direct injection was around four or 5,000 PSI. Now with the new common rail electronics, we might be 20 to 40,000 PSI. So instead of using, yes, correct. So rather than utilizing a high compression ratio and trying to slam it in there to get it to break up, to atomize it, to get this better mixing, now what we're going to do is we're going to jack that pressure up drastically and we're going to atomize it better through our injector. So that's one of the big giant reasons that we went, you know, we went away from this this is their in, in, indirect injection. These are the benefits. We were able to achieve the same thing in the direct injection as the indirect simply by jacking the pressure up and then controlling it electronically. So we, uh, we got rid of that. <clears throat> this tech tip that's in our book, <clears throat> they talk about diesel cranking speed and compression pressures. A diesel engine has to meet minimum compression. When you get out there and you turn the key, that engine has to turn at a certain speed in order to start it. If you get a diesel engine and you crank it, goes In a gas engine, you know, you get your car and you're like, oh, come on, come on, and you're like, and it, and it starts. Why will a gas start when that happens and a diesel not? because I bring it up on compression and I, boom, hit it with a spark plug, boom, that ignites and it's gonna push it down. In a diesel, because I'm using heated compression, I'm using the speed that I compress the air to create the heat. When I'm cranking a diesel that slow, I'm not, I, don't, I lose that slow compression. Instead of the heat happening, it's like, that heat that I'm creating is gonna be less, for one, and what little I am heating goes right into the cooling system. Because we don't have a lot of time, and as soon as we create a bunch of heat, we gotta get rid of the heat. So the system's designed to suck the heat out of there, and if we go up real slow, the heat just goes right into the compression system. So if you're trying to start a diesel engine and it's not turning over very fast, it's not gonna start very well. So you've gotta have 
minimum cranking speed. And they're saying in a diesel engine, 125 RPMs is minimum cranking speed. And 125 RPMs is it's a pretty decent cranking speed. It's definitely not going wrong. I mean, if it kind of comes to almost a stop, you are not getting minimum cranking speed. You got to get that engine to get it to, to go over. So normal cranking speeds for diesels between 200 and 275 and we need to be at least 125. So when I'm trying to start a diesel, and if I'm listening and you're out here in the shop and I hear that thing cranking over, I'm gonna ask you, you minimum cranking speed? Second thing I'm gonna ask you is there's smoke. Because when I crank a diesel, there should be smoke coming out. And if I don't see smoke coming out, which is unburned fuel coming out, then you're not turning the fuel on. So I want to know, are you electronically turning it on or are you manually turning it on? What some mechanism should be in play to turn it on. When you crank it over, there should be smoke. In a diesel engine, when you're cranking it, it's going to go into full, full fuel. Even if you're in an idle, it's going to go to full fuel. So the governor is going to be pulling it. And as soon as you crank, there should be a puff of smoke that will come out. And that puff of smoke is because the governor is always pulling it into full fuel until it cranks and just starts to speed up it'll go back to an idle but there should be a puff of smoke there should be smoke coming out so look for smoke and make sure that you reach this so they get into <coughs> compression ratios um, this picture just kind of shows you an engine and a turbocharger and if you're not familiar with it, the exhaust gases coming out of my engine are going to go up. A turbocharger is just two turbines. One is my exhaust turbine and one is my compressor turbine. The exhaust gases go up. Just a basic simple turbine is going to have a set of turbines. The air goes through the turbine and then continues on out the exhaust pipes we talked about yesterday. It's the only time you get something for nothing. I just have air passing by these fins that causes it to turn. There's a simple shaft that goes across. We have the same kind of fins on this side that's going to be pushing and pressurizing my cylinder. So a basic simple turbo, that's it. Now today we have elaborate turbos. We have variable fins so the the fins themselves instead of being fixed actually can change angles we have bypasses on them there's a lot of things that we can add to, to turbos today to make them more efficient and to do a little bit get better responses and stuff out of them and we'll be visiting about those but a lot of our stuff if we're going to put this on a fairway mower we're going to put it on a rough mower we're going to put it on a simple tractor really we're going to be going full throttle and we're going to drive it. We don't need all that variable geometry, all that stuff, because we're not idling and kind of working it like a truck on the road. And so we just need a simple basic turbo. This turbo, is, as you can see in real life, it looks the same. You got a fin on both sides and there's a shaft. On that shaft is going to be two bushings. Those bushings are fed by engine oil. It's the last thing to get engine oil. So when I start my engine, Engine over, turns over, oil pump starts to turn, oil pressure starts to flow through the system, goes up, finally gets to my rocker arms, starting to feed my valves, continues on up, and then feeds the turbo. So when I crank it up, and I go vroom, and I step it to the floor, this turbo is gonna take off. You can go 10,000 RPMs pretty easy, and until I get engine oil pressure, and engine oil pressure at the block, may not be engine oil pressure at the turbo. So you may be running this turbo with no oil pressure. If you're one of those people that likes to be at full throttle and then just turn the key off, that turbo is screaming at 10,000 RPMs. You shut the engine off, the first thing to lose oil pressure is the turbo. So you crank that thing off, that thing's rolling at 10,000 RPM, it's on super low friction bearings, and it's gonna sit there and spin. And it could spin for an entire minute with no oil pressure. It's 
it's really hard on a turbo. So you want that engine running as low as possible before you turn it off. And if you have a turbo, you want to roll it down as low as possible. And if you've been working it, you need to give it two or three minutes to cool off that turbo. Because if it's that hot and you've been spinning that fast, even if you throttle it down and shut it off, that hot turbo that wasn't glowing red, but maybe it was so hot you couldn't touch it, what little is in there, what's going to happen to it? It's going to cook it. So now i got this huge hot thing and right next to it's a bearing that oil is going to start to cook and deteriorate right there. So having, shutting this thing down when it's that hot is a bad idea. So never just throttle down, shut it off. So, you let them run for so diesels, if you have a turbo, you want to warm it up a little bit. Same thing, it's going to be expanding. So start it up, let it get warm, let it breathe, exercise, expand at an even rate. And when you shut it off, Make sure you cool it down for a minute or two or three or five, depends on how hot it is, and then shut it off. So most people today don't pay attention to that, and they're like, well, I got a turbo in my car, I got a turbo in my pickup, and I don't do that. But we're talking about a standard turbo. When we get into the newer turbos with all the fancy stuff that they have in them, when you pull into the parking lot and my engine slows down and I hit an idle, they have a bypass that kicks the turbo out. The turbo actually stops turning, or almost stops turning, while you're at an idle. And so now when I pull in the parking lot, throw it in park, shut it off, it's not going It's not spinning down and slowing down because they actually have some pieces to accommodate that. So people are like, they don't realize that. So when you modify your pickup and you go in there and you bypass that diverter valve, uh, it's, the waste it's the wastegate that's in there. So if you bypass the wastegate, like you hear the diesel students pull in the parking lot and they're sitting there idling and you hear the turbo whistle going on. So they bypass their wastegate so it's always on. When they pull into the parking lot, whoa, shut it off, that turbo is still spinning and no oil or damaging it. So be aware of kind of how they work and then alter how you drive them. So that's really what I want to point out here. Let's go to the next slide. They don't have it. Aftermarket stuff, like I've never seen an aftermarket thing anywhere. They just and it works fine if you just don't run it hot and crank it down. Yeah. And so, and the manufacturer's like, if you're going to do that, then we're going to sell you more turbos. So, hopefully, you don't do that. So, compression ignition, disadvantage of high compression. We talked a little bit about direct injection, indirect injection. When we get into indirect injection and we have high compression ratios, we're up there against that 23 to 1. Disadvantages, vibration, engine noise. So vibration, because I'm putting so much pressure on there, it's going to cause excessive vibration. Engine noise, so the knocking sound that you hear is somewhat has to do with this compression, but more to do something different. And then uh, heavier starters. It takes a heavier starter to actually turn this over. The head gasket has to be stronger because I have to deal with those you know, heavier clamping forces. My bolts holding my head have to be larger. So everything has to be stouter. The, the engine block needs to be stouter, the crankshaft and the connecting rod. So all that stuff has to be stronger. So those are all expenses, added expenses <coughs> that are disadvantages. So we don't like that kind of stuff. So, so we talked about direct injection. They talk about direct injection gas engines in here. So I think the next slide is going to get you, actually it's two slides. Go, go forward to a different slide. Go one more. 
and one more this is the new gas engines <clears throat> so they have new gas engines where the injector is directly involved in the engine so this looks similar to a diesel engine we got an injector we got our valves in there but you notice we also have a spark plug and so even though they have direct injection it's the gasoline it still has a spark plug that determines the timing and begins that process so this is a new EcoBoost direct injection gasoline. <clears throat> They're becoming more like a diesel and we're seeing a lot of improvements in there. It's located above it and they're usually turbocharged. <clears throat> so this back up there. So here we're talking about compression pressures and compression uh, displacement. And so in a gas engine, the displacement compression ratio, how much volume, I've taken what's the volume at bottom dead center, what's the volume at top dead center, do a division problem, and you're gonna get that compression. This is the same thing that we would do in the, uh, four, the gas four stroke class. So it's the same stuff. So we're trying to take what volume, mass and volume at bottom dead center, bring it into top dead center, what volume is left. So we're limited, we're not limited by pre-ignition and gas engines. They can use a higher turbocharging pressures. You see a lot of turbochargers. Turbochargers, not only am I using something that's a waste product, but in a turbocharger I can have a smaller engine and I can get a lot more horsepower of the same volume. So with a smaller, lighter engine, I can get a lot of horsepower by running a turbocharger and actually putting, getting more energy out of each stroke. So turbochargers are gonna increase the volumetric efficiency. Another thing that caused uh, diesel engines in the old days to be s slower, we couldn't exceed 1800, 2000 RPMs, was volumetric, volumetric efficiency. So having two valves, not having a turbocharger, you simply could not get enough air in there and get exhaust out to make them efficient. So they went to four valves, virtually everything now is kind of going to four valves to get volumetric efficiency. And then by going to turbochargers, those two items allow us to go at a higher RPM and still get volumetric efficiency. So it's, it's a big game changer in the last 15, 20 years. <clears throat> So a typical diesel engine packs three to four times more air than a similar displaced gas engine. So you can pack it in there and go. By going to the next slide and going to this EcoBoost engine, we can add a turbocharger, we can pack all that air in there and then squirt the fuel in and actually do what we want to do. So we can start to get in a gas engine a little more power out of it by adding the turbocharger and putting it putting the fuel in directly so so looking at how these are direct injection this one you see is two it could actually be four valves you notice that the piston itself has a dome shape in it. So there'll be a shape within the piston that's directing and it determines the swirl. That same style is like what we would find here. So on a diesel engine, they have some kind of shape within the piston. This one is a direct injection, injector's right here. The injector shoots, it's gonna cause it to swirl and that's gonna cause it to swirl all the way around. So this one will have fuel coming out in streams. The streams are gonna be like this or like this pattern. So it could be four, sometimes there'll be five. But you'll notice that even if I'm using this particular setup and I'm shooting it, I have heavy amounts of fuel and light amounts of fuel and I have no fuel. So the problem with the injector system like that is not evenly spraying fuel throughout the whole area, it's spraying streams. If I have an injector that's bad, one of those holes gets too large. And that could happen if I ran water through it, I can actually blast and snap and blow out one of those holes. If instead of four streams or five streams, I have one big heavy stream hitting this piston, just gets it wet, it'll actually cause it to burn and we're gonna have problems. So those 
atomization is important and no matter what I'm going to have air that's going to be heavy and then lighter areas that are going to be burning so as soon as it shoots out into that flame or out into that piston area when it's hot enough this outer edges are going to begin to burn and the inner edges don't have any oxygen to them yet they're not going to be burning <clears throat> so that gets us into the different phases that a that a diesel engine goes into No, because it's under a high pressure, you don't see vapor lock in a diesel. So we're gonna be pumping the fuel and putting it under pressure. In a gas engine, everything is such low pressure, that's why we get vapor lock. And and the fuel gasoline lends itself much more to if, we, if we get gasoline hot, it gets bubbles in it. Diesel is so thick, it doesn't get bubbles in it. So we don't see vapor lock in a diesel engine. <clears throat> so diesel combustion is both lean and stratified. So they talk about layered. When we talk about layered, we're talking about you get it's concentrated in particular areas. So that swirling that takes place, that air movement in there kind of takes and shakes it up and stirs it up, but it's still gonna go into the cylinder as a layer uh, in concentrated areas. Regions of fuel and air are mixed closest to the stoichiometric ratio and have reached the auto ignition temperature, they ignite first. So this lighter colored out here is gonna light first and this is gonna burn last. Multiple ignition points, high pressure cause fuel to burn rapidly after combustion begins. So what creates the knock in a diesel? The, the old engines that were mechanical, yeah. You started up, you hear that clack, 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 clack. I mean, it was just noisy. I mean, you knew that GM that we talked about that was so noisy that people didn't like. What created the noise? Well, the noise is going to come from the fact that we have four areas of fuel. Each one of these, as soon as that stoichiometric ratio is there, as soon as we have enough temperature, it's going to be in to burn. And I might have a flame here, I might have a flame here, there might be a flame on this side, there might be a flame here and here. So all these yellow spots could be flames. They're ignition points. And so what happens is when those ignition points, those flames, when they run into each other, when two explosions, two big flames run into each other, that's where the knock comes from. So it's just like in the pre-ignition where you have a flame that begins in one spot and then the spark plug fires and the two flame fronts hit, that's where you get a knock. So in the old days, because we would pour a lot of fuel in there because injections were single point injections, you, you injected everything at one time. So you throw it all in there and then six different places all ignited at the same time and when those flame fronts hit each other, you got a knock. That was the old days. We got away from that when we went to electronic ignitions and we're gonna see that here quickly is with electric, uh, with computer controlled ignition systems and electronic injectors, we're able to reduce that and virtually eliminate knocking in a diesel engine. So I look at the power stroke, common truck that's out there. The first year they came out, rattle, 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 even with electronic. But as you go through the years, the later the years they went, the quieter they got. So the more they refined that ignition timing and that computer programming and worked on it, they were able to get rid of the knock. So, and it really was the computer that did it. <clears throat> so there's where our knock comes from. <clears throat> So modern engines have pilot or split shot injection, and we're gonna talk about that. So let's go to the next one. Elements of con good combustion. So a diesel engine, we want these things. We wanna promote efficient combustion, enabling formulation of good air fuel mixtures. So the design of the cylinder chamber. So even in the indirect injection, when we get into studying that, you're gonna find there's a lot of different forms, different designs to help promote better combustion flow, better mixing of the fuel and air 
to make it more efficient, to, to burn it better, and to reduce sound and all that stuff that we had. So we're always trying to work on the combustion chamber to improve it. We're also promoting maximum conversion of combustible energy, so the, the fuel itself into mechanical force. So how do we get that stuff in a good form, get it all converted, all burning, to actually usable force? So Ethan, fuel consumption, so leaner fuel mixtures promote better fuel economy, diesels burn leaner, diesels lean burn combustion systems help achieve the best fuel economies compared to any other ignition system. So in a diesel engine, because we have a lot of air in that engine and not very much fuel, we're going to burn it better. They're using a ratio of 35 to 1. But, you know, there's no system out there even past this point. So, you know, skip on. You're asking how oh, was it running later on to get it? Right. It's full? Four minutes till full. Okay. Go to the next slide. So combustion chambers, we want to minimize production of nit nit nitrous oxides. So our noxious emissions. So these are the things we're looking at. Hydrocarbons, but we're not looking at hydrocarbons. We're looking for nitrous oxide and particulate matter. Those are the two things that we're worried about in a diesel engine. In a gas engine, we're looking at all four of those items. But in a diesel engine, we want to minimize noise. We want to provide fuel, good fuel economy by utilizing all the fuel that's in there. And we want it to have good smooth engine operation. So we want that engine to be smooth and we get rid of the knock, we're going to get smoother engine operation and a more comfortable ride for the operator. So diesel air fuel ratios. I skip something. I don't know what I skipped. So, uh, our fuel ratios. We talked about that. Types of chambers. So I think we'll st we're going to stop right there because I want to come and when I start talking about the difference between a direct injection and and indirect. So we'll stop there.